Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we can be here tonight. I thank you. I thank you. As I was sharing in this room before, it really does kind of boggle my mind as we're going to talk about your mind matters. Um, it boggles my mind that you planned this night before we ever stepped in here. That just amazes me. Lord, we're going to share a scripture in just a little while that says you know our thoughts and that you go before us and you come behind us. How wonderful is that? How loving are you? How well and intimately you know us. It's amazing. I ask you, Lord, now please anoint me one more time. Please let the mantle of teacher come and rest on me and enable me to be absolutely accurate and clear and plain with uh, what it is that you've put on my heart for tonight. I ask you, Lord, that the, um, that the word will just be alive. And it is alive all on its own, but alive in us, doing a deep work, a deep work to affect our minds and our spirits and going deep into us to bring us life that's really life. And we're just going to give you glory and honor and praise for it in Jesus' name. Can you say amen, amen, amen? So we began last time this series, Your Mind Matters. Your Mind Matters. And what we did last time was um, the introduction. Um, I didn't give it a title, I suppose, um, that I could have given it a title, and probably it would be God Knows Your Thoughts. God Knows Your Thoughts. Um, I just want to make you aware that that is absolutely truth. And I shared with you the reason that we do a teaching like this in Help for Hurting Women, making it available to anyone who is hurting, is because God cares about every part of our lives. Everything about our lives matters to God, and that includes our thought life. It really does. Now, sometimes there is precious peace of mind. The Word promises us that peace will come to guard our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus. That's a promise of God that it will come. But sometimes there are mind struggles. Any of you ever have any mind struggles? Yes, exactly. Um, especially during what we've gone through the last couple of years, but that doesn't make any difference. I mean, my, I had a mind struggle today, today. And um, it, it, things just come, things happen. Um, we, um, our sister who prayed, Sister Love who prayed, Sister Jean, um, she prayed uh, the theme scripture here that comes from 2 Corinthians um, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, and it basically says to us that it doesn't matter what kind of trouble we might be in, including trouble in our minds, that we have a Lord who is the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who will come to us and comfort us no matter what the trouble is. And it goes on to say that when we receive that comfort, we go on, then the plan is to give it to others. That's what Bobby was talking about. That's what Dina was talking about and Kelly, that we go on then to give to others what we've received from God. But I said to you last time, you know, trouble, and these may feel like these may seem to you that these are feelings, but all of it is birthed in our minds. Trouble may be that uh, we have worries, that we're fearful, that we're anxious, sad, lonely. We feel helpless or hopeless, maybe angry, confused, tormented, or all of the above, right? But the, the, yes, they're all feelings, but they originate first in our minds. Correct? Correct? And um, I shared with you 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24, that says God, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24, that God has a plan to bring us to wholeness, spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, soul, and body. 
And I love verse 24 because it says, the one who has called you is faithful and he will do it. This is his plan if we'll just give it over and let him do what he wants to do. I shared with you last time that the word um, in the Greek uh, that is used in the New Testament for mind literally means mental functions of perception, how we perceive something and understand it, how we know it or judge it. And it's also... Our mind is also the seat of our imagination and the seat of our attitudes. So we are on a journey here. And my deep desire is for you to know from the get-go that the Lord knows everything about you, including your thoughts. Um, But I want that to not bring condemnation to you. I want that to bring comfort to you. So I shared with you last time as we were closing, and then I read that wonderful devotional to you called The Look. Um, Psalm 139, Psalm 139, one through six from the Passion Translation. Let this trust your heart, let this encourage your heart, help you to know you can trust the Lord and that he knows you as no other and that he loves you. Psalm 139, one through six from the Passion Translation. Lord, you know everything there is to know about me. Now just think, it's David who wrote this. David who thought a lot of things that he ought not to have thought and then acted on those things. And yet he is pouring out his heart, Lord, you know everything there is to know about me. You perceive every movement of my heart and soul. And you understand my every thought before it even enters my mind. How amazing is that? Amen? I mean, that's a wow. You are so intimately aware of me, Lord. You read my heart like an open book. And you know all the words I'm about to speak before I even start a sentence. Wow! You know, every step I will take before my journey even begins. Listen to this, verse 5. You've gone into my future to prepare the way, and in kindness you follow behind me to spare me from the harm of my past. You have laid your hand on me. This is just too wonderful, deep and incomprehensible, Your understanding of me brings me wonder and strength. Can you say amen? Isn't that just fantastic? I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. So your mind matters. You know, sometimes what's going on in our minds is like going to an Omnimax theater. How many of you have ever been in one of those max screen Omnimax theaters? I mean, the screen is gigantic. The place is filled with sound. It's not just a standard screen. I mean, it goes all the way over here and all the way over here and all the way up and all the way down. And sometimes what's going on in our minds is so consuming that it's like there's, we're in an Omnimax theater. And sometimes it's like it's just a closed loop. You know, you go through it and then it's like, just like it all starts all over again. Um, so, um, Anna, today, these games that the kids were playing, were there any like virtual reality games? It's like they're, yeah, crazy, yeah. Yeah, so it's like they're in it. You know, it's like virtual reality. But sometimes that's exactly like what is going on in our minds, right? Are you with me? Are you with me? Now, I want to tell you that the Word of God has 40 verses in which you find the word thoughts. 40 verses. 
So God is definitely speaking to the reality of our thoughts. But this get, get this one. For the word mind, where mind is used in the Bible, there are 163 references. God knew the importance of our minds, our thought life, our thoughts. Can you say amen? Now, if, if you just think about things a bit, how many of you have ever heard the word mindset used? Okay, mindset. It's not an uncommon word. A mindset, that means your mind is set in a certain way. And everything that you have ever watched, read, everything you've been taught, everything you've heard, either externally or internally, all of that has contributed to your mindset. All of that. And, and it's interesting because we all have heard the term, and it's real, that we have a thought life, right? We have a thought life. Our thoughts are part of our lives. We have a thought life. Now, later on in the teaching, I will share with you something scientific, and that is if you have thought the same thought over and over and over again, science has proven and brain study has proven that you can literally make grooves in your brain. Isn't that scary? right? So I mean, you're literally making grooves in your brain so that the same thought is happening over and over and over again. Uh, every once in a while, Pastor, Bet how many of you saw Pastor Betzer this last weekend? Wasn't that spectacular? That was, at yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Pastor, if you should see this, that was fabulous. His reenactment of um, John the Beloved uh, and his in his later years. That was absolutely phenomenal. So touching and so powerful. One of the devotions that Pastor used to do for us from time to time when he was lead pastor here, um, it, um, he would do something having to do with the mind. And one of his favorite devotions came from, um, he, there was a, an example used in it. And it was um, a, a road sign that was in the country in the area where he grew up in Iowa. And it was a very muddy, rutty area, okay? Very muddy and rutty. And how many of you have ever been in the country enough to know that when it starts to rain and it's muddy, there are ruts there, right? You, you, wave at me if you have a clue, okay. <laughs> yeah. So there was a sign at the beginning of this road, quote, road, that says, that said, choose your rut well, because you're gonna be in it for a long time. <laughs> and that's good advice, isn't it? Yeah, choose your rut well, you're gonna be in it for a long time. Now, whenever I am thinking about this, my mind always goes to that old adage because I have heard people say to me over and over again, well, Pastor Connie, you just don't understand. I have been thinking this way all my life. My mother thought this way. My grandmother thought this way. I've been taught to think this way. I just, I've been thinking this way all my life. You, you can't honestly expect that my mindset can begin to be changed, that I can literally get out of this rut. Well, how many of you have ever heard the expression, you can't teach an old dog new tricks? Have you ever heard that? Can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, let me tell you a story. And uh, what God did in my heart when this happened. So uh, some years ago, uh, we had just like 
the cutest dog in the world. This dog used to sit out on the bow pulpit of our boat when we would be in a marina and people would walk by and they thought it was a stuffed animal. I mean, he was just the cutest thing. And uh, his name was Buddy, okay? And um, so you kind of can see it. So he's the brown one. This is Buddy, okay? Kelly, can you see it? Got it? Okay, this is Buddy. All right. So we had Buddy from when Buddy was a baby, and uh, he traveled all over the place. He had more frequent flyer miles than most people in the world. He traveled all over the place with us, and uh, he went boating with us. And uh, so Buddy got to be 14, and he was decrepit. That's the best way to describe it. He was decrepit. And when Buddy needed to go outside to be too good, you understand what that means? A little dog can be number one good or number two good. <laughs> so when he's taking care of everything, when he needed to go out to be too good, he was to the point of where he had to be carried. He could not actually walk outside into the yard. Poor Buddy, it was so sad. So it was recommended to us that perhaps it might help Buddy if we got a puppy, okay? So Willie came into our lives when he was four months old. So the white one is Willie. Do you see him? Yeah, white one is Willie. So he came in when Willie was four months old and Buddy was 14. Well, through all the years, when Buddy wasn't decrepit, he would go outside and he would be too good, and then he would come inside and he would run right to the treat cabinet to get his reward, right? Okay, he would run right to the treat cabinet. Well, he couldn't do that anymore. He couldn't even walk outside. So we'd carry him outside, and then we'd carry him back inside, and we'd carry him to the treat closet, and he'd get his treat. Okay. So Willie comes into the family, right? And the first day, we go outside. We go outside, we carry Buddy out, and Willie goes out, and we come back in, and uh, we take them both to the treat cabinet, and Willie learns, hey, this is a cool deal here, right? Okay, so if I do what I'm supposed to do outside, I get to come in and I get to go to the treat cabinet and I get a treat, right? So that's what happens for the first couple of days. And on day number three, we carry Buddy outside. He's too good and he runs to the door. And we open the door, and he runs to the treat cabinet and beats Willie to the treat cabinet. Right? All about motivation, right? All about motivation. And I'm standing there looking at this, and God says to me, see, Connie, you really can teach an old dog new tricks. Amen? Amen. It's all about motivation. It's all about motivation and allowing the motivation. But isn't that wonderful? I mean, it was a miracle. He was healed. <laughs> he was just suddenly healed and, and made it. And I'm telling you what, that never changed. I mean, until almost the very end, he was the first back to the treat cabinet every time. Every time. Yeah, absolutely amazing. So what I'm saying to you is don't let the enemy of your soul convince you that your mind cannot be changed, that your mindset cannot be changed, that your grooves cannot be changed, because that's exactly what he wants to do. And the title of today's class is The Battle. It is a battle. It's a battle. Turn with me, please, in your Bibles or your smart whatevers to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. 
Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. Now, this is in the New Testament. Paul is writing, and he is writing to the church. He's writing to those who, who are Christ followers, but he knows they have a struggle. But it's real for us today. So Ephesians 6, starting at verse 10, says to us, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. If you have your Bible, take your pen, underline that. The devil has schemes. He has schemes. Do you see that? Okay. Um, Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And verse 12 says to us, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Let me tell you that there is an unseen battle going on in the heavenly realms that you cannot see with your natural eyes. But I think you know it's real because you feel it. (laughs) I think you know it's real. But this is real. And we must understand that our battle, our war, our struggle, and I'm talking about the mind thing, because usually, always, whatever's going on involves other people people, other, thing, other things people are doing or saying or not doing or presenting or not pre- Are you with me? Our battle is not against flesh and blood. It feels like it, but it isn't. And part of the devil's scheme is he wants you fighting other people rather than fighting the way we need to be against spiritual dynamics. Are you with me? Our fight is not against flesh and blood. It's not against other people. And listen to me. Hear my heart on this. It's also not against yourself. You will hear it said, you are your own worst enemy. No, you are not. The enemy of your soul is your worst enemy. Are you with me? Okay. This battle is not against other people, and it's not against yourself. You are not your own worst enemy. Now, um, I want to talk to you about an example that came to me in my life some years ago when I was trying to understand how this whole thing worked. And on your tables, face down, you will find a picture that looks like this. Everyone have one? Is there anyone who does not have one? Everyone has got it, okay. All right, so what are we looking at here? We're looking at the picture of a bullfight, correct? We're looking at a picture of a bullfight. There is nothing about bullfights that I like. Nothing about bullfights that I like. But when this example was given to me years ago, it had such a powerful impact on my life that I absolutely want to share it with you. So let's take a look at what happens in a bullfight, okay? What do we have here? Well, 
we have probably what is about a 2,000 pound bull. Do you see that? A 2,000 pound bull. And we have a Toreador who probably weighs about 120 pounds. He is small, right? He is small. He's thin. 120 pounds, probably. Now, do you see that bull's shoulder? Do you see the blade that is in that bull's shoulder? Right? Okay. How in the world does this happen? This happens. Because the bull thinks the cape is the enemy, right? The bull thinks the cape is the enemy. Look at this picture. Where is the bull's focus, right? Not on the Toreador, right? The focus is on the cape. And every time the bull chases the cape, the bull opens itself wide open to be killed by the Toreador. Do you see it? Do you see it? Every time that we fight flesh and blood, rather than fighting where the real battle is for our minds, we're chasing the cape. We're chasing the cape. I want you to have this picture. I want you to put it someplace where you see it often. And every time that you ha start to have a struggle regarding what someone else is doing and, and what that is causing to happen in your mind, just look at this. You might even need to write at the top of it, am I chasing the cape? Because every time we're fighting flesh and blood, we are chasing the cape. And the enemy is winning. Are you with me? And, it, and it's amazing to me that when we go on and read through Ephesians, putting on the full armor, <laughs> one of the things that we are to do is to have the shield of faith in place to protect us from all the fiery darts of the enemy. And here is a visual presentation. When I was in um, Spain on a mission trip for Project Rescue, I, uh, and bullfighting is big there, I bought this beautiful ceramic piece. And it's very beautiful. As I told you, I, w I could almost say, I hate bullfights. I hate it. I hate the whole concept of it. But I bought this, and I keep this in my bedroom, and I see it every day. Every day when I'm getting up in the morning, every evening when I'm going to bed, and I am just reminded, because there it is, that bull is chasing the cape and leaving itself wide open to the enemy. If you got the point, could you wave at me? Praise God, amen? Don't chase the cape. Don't chase the cape. Amen. Um, 2 Corinthians 2.11. 2 Corinthians 2, actually 10 and 11, says this. And I'm, I'm including verse 10 because it's important. What has happened in this setting of 2 Corinthians is that something has happened within the church. And there is someone who has done something in the church really wrong, really sinful, really egregious, really wrong. And Paul is saying to the people of the church, you must forgive this one. You must forgive. Now, for hurting people, this is a biggie. This is big. Because part of what holds us in our minds is that we want to hold on to the unforgiveness. Because we've been hurt, we've been mistreated, trust has been broken, people who we should have trust blew it, 
<laughs> we've been abandoned, we've been treated unfairly, and that that mind just works with the unforgiveness. I can't, the, see, the statement, the groove, I can't ever let this go. I can't ever forgive. And every time we think the thought again, even if we're not saying it out of our mouths, every time we're thinking the thought again, the groove is going deeper. Are you with me? So Ephesians, 2 Corinthians 2, starting at verse 10, again, Paul is writing to the church, and he's saying to them, okay, now, this situation has been dealt with, and he's saying, now forgive. And anyone you forgive, Paul says, I also forgive. In other words, he's not going to carry somebody else's grudge. Oh, there's a concept. Because sometimes our offenses are because we're taking up somebody else's offenses, right? Something that has been done to someone else. So we're taking up the offense. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. Now listen to verse 11. They're connected. In order that Satan might not outwit us. For we are not unaware of his schemes. Are you with me? Yeah, he has schemes. And part of it is directly connected to our unwillingness to forgive. You know, it's only the cross that makes forgiveness just, right? It's the cross that makes forgiveness just just. And if we hold on to that unforgiveness, I mean, we're the one hooked. <laughs> we're, we're the one, you know, Satan's got his hook in our jaw if we continue to hold on to it. The cross, Jesus hanging on the cross saying, Father, forgive them, right? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And our response is, seriously? They knew exactly what they were doing. But no, deeper than that. And that's so often exactly how it is with people in our lives. Father, forgive them, and I forgive them. It's, um, so just make sure you understand, the enemy of your soul, including your mind, has schemes. The message says, we are not oblivious to his sly ways. We're not oblivious, okay? And that's, that's a good declaration for us to make. I'm not oblivious. I'm not going to be blinded to this. 2 Corinthians 10.3 2 Corinthians 10.3 says this, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. Well, how does the world wage war? They fight each other. Uh, we can't turn on the TV without experiencing it, right? How does the world wage war? They fight each other. Keep your focus in these days. Keep your focus in every day. Amen? And don't let the enemy suck you in. How does the world wage war? By fighting one another. What do they do? They struggle against flesh and blood. Right? The message for this says, the world doesn't fight fair. <laughs> But we don't live or fight our battles that way. We never have, and we never will. Amen. What a good declaration. Amen? Amen. All right, so I want you to understand what I'm saying here. There is absolutely a fight going on. There is. doesn't matter if you can't see it in the natural. 
It's going on. This is real. And the fight is over you. It's for you. It's for your mind, this fight that is going on. Because you are, any battle that's ever fought in the natural is fought for territory. It's fought for land. Just think about it, right? Any, any battle ground, any battle that's ever fought, is fought for territory. Well, listen to me. You are the territory that we're talking about. It's your mind. It's your precious mind. You are the territory. This battle is real. Even though you can't see it in the natural, it's unseen. There are real schemes. There are real strategies. And I'm telling you, it starts with our minds. Starts with our minds. So as we unfold this in the weeks to come, I'm going to be taking us back over and over again to honestly and truly evaluate what's the scheme? What is the enemy trying to use against me in my mind to mess me up, to trip me up, to, to, to get me in a place where I'm going to get worse and not better? We're just going to honestly evaluate this. Ephesians 6, I started with it. Ephesians 6, 10 and 11. Now I'm going to read this passage of scripture to you in two other translations because this is so important for you to understand. Ephesians 6, 10 and 11 from the Amplified Bible says, in conclusion, be strong in the Lord, empowered through your union with him. Draw your strength from him, that strength which his boundless might provides. Put on God's whole armor, the armor of a heavy-armed soldier, which God supplies. Why? That you may be able to successfully stand up against all the strategies and all the deceits of the devil. Amen? There's a plan here. God knew. I, I opened with Psalm 139. God knew. He knew the mind struggle we would have. He knew the mind battle we would have before we ever had it. He knows. He understands. He knows it's hard, but he has also made a plan. Amen? He's made a plan if we will engage it. He has made a plan. Now let me read you Ephesians 6, 10 through 18 from the message. Because I want to make sure that you understand you have no need to fear. There is, the enemy wants you afraid. He wants you paralyzed. There is no need to fear. God is for you. And he has already gone before you to make this plan. He's there for you at this moment to make this plan. And I read it to you at the beginning. He's already working so that your past does not have the power to destroy you, to mess up your mind. Amen? Amen. So Ephesians 6, starting at verse 10, now from the message. And that about wraps it up. God is strong, and he wants you strong. So take everything the master has set out for you, well-made weapons of the best materials, and put them to use so that you will be able to stand up to everything that the devil throws your way. This is no weekend war that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps. A life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. Verse 13, be prepared. 
You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get. Every weapon God has issued so that when it's all over but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Amen? Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation, they're more than words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. God's word is an indispensable weapon. And in the same way, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. Pray hard and pray long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. That's why we come in here. That's why we do this. Keep your eyes open and keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out. Can you say amen? Amen. God wants to do something very tangible, very personal, and very real. And there isn't time for us to be in delusion. There's not time for us to actually think that what's going on in the heavenlies isn't real. Oh, it's real. It's real, okay? And we do not have the luxury of thinking that the enemy does not have schemes and methods to mess up our minds. He definitely does. I will often say to people, you know, the enemy does know your hot button. He knows your hot button. He knows the one, that will, the, the theme, the scheme, the method that will most likely trip you up and take you back to what you'll hear me call a lot, stinking thinking, right? To thinking that is not productive. But I wanna say to you tonight, God is so good. He already knows. He's already gone before us. He's already made the plan, amen? He's before us, he's behind us, and he knows what we're thinking right now. And he knows what needs to happen right now at this very moment. Can you say amen? Can you say amen? Come on. Can you say amen? Amen. Okay. If you would bow your heads, and those of you watching, listening, everything I'm talking about here is impossible without the power of God working in us working in us, not just working for us, but working in us. What's going on in our minds is an inside job. What God does is an inside job. And we must invite him in to be Savior. We read about it, to be Savior, to be Lord of our lives. And if you've never done that, this is, we got, we have to start at the beginning we must begin at the beginning. Lord, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe you came here and you lived a sinless life. And your mind was absolutely under the control of your Father. Absolutely. Absolutely. This strength is yours, Lord. And I want you, I want you to be in me. I want your mind, I want your plan in me. I, I declare, I believe you're the son of God. And yes, you went to Calvary for me, but you're alive, alive, so that I can live including my thought life, that my thought life can be redeemed. So if you have never accepted Jesus as your savior, this is your moment. Or maybe like me, along the way you did, and then you lost your way. You lost your way, and I'm telling you, I lost my way, starting with what happened 
in my mind. That's where I lost my way. So if either one of those is you, I want to pray for you right now. I want you to pray for you right now. So if you need to accept Jesus as your Savior or wholeheartedly recommit your life to him right now, would you just raise your hand, anybody in here, looking across the room? You need to accept Jesus or wholeheartedly rededicate your life. Those of you watching and listening, this is your moment. This is your moment to simply say, Jesus, I accept you now. I accept you now as my Savior. I make you Lord of my life. Lord of my life. Please forgive me for every way that I have sinned and missed it. Please forgive me. Wash me clean. And now you are mine, Jesus, and I am yours for now and forevermore. Now, with no one looking around, if you would say to me, well, Pastor Connie, I think it's relatively clear to me that I have an issue with chasing the cape. I'm having an issue with what other people are doing to me or what they've done to me, and it's affecting my mind. If that is you, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand and then just put it right back down. Okay. Lots of hands in this room. Lots of hands. Okay. I just want to lead you in a prayer, if you all will pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you right now, and I thank you, Lord, that you have a plan for my mind <laughs> to be renewed. Sometimes I guess I'm kind of like an old dog. <laughs> but I thank you, Lord. You're teaching me new tricks how to think, and how to give it to you. Heavenly Father, I don't want to chase the cape. I don't want to fight other people because I understand it's going to give me nowhere and the enemy will just keep winning. So I ask you to forgive me as I forgive. And I thank you, Lord, that I'm on a journey now. You're going to renew my mind. You're going to make me a whole lot smarter. And I'm going to get it when the enemy is coming against me in my mind. I thank you, Lord, for the power that is in me because your life is in me. My mind matters to you, Lord. You knew what I would be thinking even today. You knew my struggle. And you have my victory. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Now let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for meeting us in this place tonight. You know every thought. You know every struggle. You know every scheme and every method of the enemy. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I take authority in the spirit realm over these schemes and methods and devices against every woman in this room and all of those in the sound of my voice. I take authority over it in the name of Jesus Christ. And I lose the ministering power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, just begin a work in our minds that only you can do, but that you have always planned to do. Always. And Lord, I declare that women are going to go from this place and people are going to go from listening encouraged that you have a plan. You have a plan to turn off the Omnimax screen. You have a plan to end the torment and the sadness and the difficulty. 
that plays over and over again in our minds. Your plan is to end it. And I thank you, Lord, you're going to teach us how to do this and not just do it once because your word says we're in this for the long haul, Lord. We're in it for the long haul, and it's going to be amazing because you are. Now, Lord, I ask you to take women from this place with huge angels on guard round about them to their places of rest tonight. And I ask you, God, that they will put their picture someplace where they will be reminded that tonight and tomorrow and in the days to come, it is not the time to chase the cape in Jesus' name. Can you say amen? Can you give him praise? Amen.